You are listening to the Unslaved Podcast. Please welcome Michael Tassarian and David Whitehead. And welcome everyone to the Unslaved Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us here again. I'm very, very excited about today's show. Uh, we have Alex Sakiris with us here from Skeptico.com. I am uh, a little bit recent to his work in his podcast, The Skeptical Podcast. I also uh, have got his book, Science is Wrong, about almost everything. I don't know if you can get much more controversial than that today. Uh, <laughs> but uh, just to give you a quick bio about our guest, Alex is an entrepreneur turned science podcaster who wrote the book, Why Science is Wrong, about almost everything. His Skeptical show has been running since 2007 and has attracted millions of downloads and a fair amount of attention from those serious about frontier science on human consciousness. The Skeptical Show is an internet-centric internet radio show featuring dialogues with leading consciousness researchers, scholars, and thinkers. And uh, there's also a fair amount of good intellectual debate, some intellectual sparring on that show, which is needed so we can get to the bottom of these very important issues. So Alex, welcome to the Unslaved Podcast, my friend. Thank you, David. It's great to be here and to be joined by Michael. I'm looking forward to just that kind of conversation that kind of pushes a lot of these boundaries. So it's going to be fun. Absolutely. Yeah, same here. Well, we have an opening quote we're going to go with today to sort of set the, the, the initial tone. It comes from Anthony Peak and Irvin Laszlo from The Immortal Mind. So Peak says, even if consciousness would cease when the brain is inoperative, this would not prove that consciousness is produced by the brain. When we shut down our computer, cell phone, TV, or radio, the information display it displays disappears. Yet the information itself does not cease to exist. Just as the information displayed by electronic instruments exists independently of these instruments, so, do, so does the consciousness displayed by the brain, which exists independently of the brain that transmits it. So, uh, Michael, maybe I'll throw it over to you to start us off here. Well, again, welcome, welcome one and all to our podcast. And uh, Alex, it's, the book is great. I've read it from cover to cover, followed all of your stuff. So it's a great personal you know, privilege that uh, you know, we have you on finally. I uh, wanted that for a while. But you're on strong ground with what you do. I know you go for the jugular. It's very needed. You have literally a boots on the ground engagement. You know, Go for the jugular with these people. Bring them on. Yeah, give them a platform for them to say their piece. Uh, but at the same time, be adamant that the silliness and the palava and the, also the thin research, you, you, what you've really done is you've shown, exposed the dirty trickery of it all. The fact that it's based on very thin arguments and proofs. We're talking materialism here. We're talking physicalism. Uh, of course, both of us, all of us, David as well, we're all working to see the end of that paradigm, right? So that we can free it, free the world from the shackles. And so that we can get down to some real true philosophy and true insights uh, but but of course that is deconstructive and i think you know that so well that exposing the silliness of it means going into their world going into the world and mastering what they say they know and 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 going into the you know like the satanic mills to show how fraudulent and unsustainable the workings are now your work personally uh on your show and in the book it's just incredible what you do there is you're basically obliterating their whole reductionist palava uh, in, in a very systematic way. You've interviewed, interviewed hundreds of eminent men. This is, we're talking academics, writers, scientists, uh, thinkers. You put them in the dock, so to speak, and you've drilled them, you, uh, you know, and you've raked them over the coals, really, to expose <laughs> the, whole dog, the whole dogmatic you know, uh, stew of it all, is the only way I can put it. Now, the strangest thing is, you've also, I don't know what it is about you, you must have them under hypnotism or something, because they actually admit in your presence how prejudiced, inadequate, one-sided, and often, you know, well, just, yeah, as I say, you know, unresearched their research is. Uh, they fail to honor appointments when you set them up. They're so frightened to even engage you, some of them. You've, you've had some of them hang up the phone uh, right on you in front of thousands of, of, of witnesses and listeners, which is, again, a capitulation, isn't it? Uh, and they've even spit poison at you when finally you start winning the points. So all of this. So what what an incredible platform you've created. What an incredible uh, methodology you have to take these people down by going into their work and showing that even though they got long beards, it doesn't make a high priest. You know, it makes a goat. <laughs> and you've made, you've made goats out of these guys. It's just absolutely refreshing to see that these people are not just dogma. They're not just dogmatic. They're dogma haunted. It very much as the religious are, 
But, you know, the scientists are the ones with the biggest egos right now. The baton has been somewhat passed to them in the 20th century, that they're the know-it-alls. So taking them down is very, very valuable because it's deconstructive so that we can then erect something more sane, more human in its place. Would, would you not agree with that? I don't know if that was your intention, you know, so tell us about how well, you started with that. I love this phrase. I just wrote it down. Dogma haunted. I think that's so, uh, so awesome. And it's so spot on in a lot of ways. Now, in a lot of ways, I didn't really see some of this playing out the way that it has and the way that you described, but you're, you're right, it has played out like that. One of the advantages of taking a scientific approach, and my initial kind of intent was, well, I'm just gonna trust science on this stuff, you know? Let's see what science has to say. And I had a, a sense that this materialistic idea of consciousness that, you are a biological robot in a meaningless world. I had a sense that that was completely ridiculous, but I wanted to see what the other side said. And, I, and to your point, I was like, I'm willing to play on your field. I'm willing to kind of take a scientific approach. Let's see what the science says. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe what you've discovered will, will show me that I'm really a biological robot in a meaningless universe. So staying true to the scientific method as it's formally understood, you know, as opposed to how it's manipulated and played out, but just saying, hey, these are the rules, we all agree, right? I mean, this is how we do things, has been a, a, a great tool in doing that. But I want to get back to your dogma haunted kind of phrase, because I think it really captures something that that is really deeper that you've tapped into. And that's that when you do push folks, and particularly when you push them with their science and the failings of their science, they do have this certain sense that, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm really am conflicted because I really do know that I've had to kind of prop up some of these ideas, some of this dogma, and I know deep down that I don't really believe it. You know, uh, David, in the introduction, I love that quote because it's very timely. It's in the news. Several people have already emailed me and, and sent me messages today about just another example of this recent research just today published that says, hey, you know what? Maybe the brain doesn't die when we think it dies and all this. And I, I, it's it's another example of this what I call backdoor materialism, right? So if you take the spiritually transformative experiences of, for example, near-death experience or out-of-body experience, all these things have completely undermined this wacky materialism, you're a biological robot. And more and more people have come to accept, gosh, you know, consciousness doesn't seem to survive after death. There's all these people that have near-death experiences. There's all these people that have psychedelic experiences. So I, I have to start questioning that. And what I've seen over and over again, exactly to the point as you laid out in the beginning, Michael, is what, what mainstream science has done is tried to sneak in and undermine that a little bit with these little phony baloney studies like, oh, these rats have a burst of activity in their brain that we never knew about. And now we're finding it in University of Michigan study. So what I've done consistently is say, hey, great, if that's the data, let's go with it. But let's bring in the people who've really researched it. Let's bring in the best near-death experience researchers. Let's bring in Sam Parnia, leading uh, expert on Dr. Sam Parnia, on resuscitation, one of the leading experts in the world. Let's bring in Dr. Pin Van Lamo. Let's bring in um, one of my favorites, uh, Dr. Jeff Long, you know, let's bring in the real science, Dr. Penny Sartori, who I'm going to speak to again, just about this most recent study. Let's see what they say. And over and over again, they say it's bullshit and they'll tell, they'll break it down and they'll tell you why it's bullshit. And I have no qualms about then going back to people and saying, okay, you know, that's what you reported. This guy says it's bullshit. Straighten me up. You know, who's telling the truth? Where's the bullshit really lie? And to your point, haven't over you and over haven't, again. Haven't you had it, it people kind of who even, they're just faking it? Yes, haven't you had people, scientists on, where you won almost every point that you, I can't remember the guy who it was, but then he went away and actually completely bold facedly 
presented that he had won all the points and 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 went on continuing you know as if nothing had ever happened but this materialism is almost like i describe it like some sort of worm hideous worm that no matter how many times you cut it up and destroy it because remember real materialism is very easy to refute even though i call it a dirty trick it's actually quite commonsensically refuted and has been since the 1700s in which we've had the greatest thought the world has ever known. What is this worm that keeps growing new heads and coming back? So again, people like yourself have to then take it on one more time. It's a, almost a miracle. It, it's almost a, 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 it's amazing, not a miracle. It's amazing that this thing can grow new heads, whether it's with Sam Harris or Dawkins. or whatever. The paradigm has been shattered in the 1700s and the 1600s. Expound ja Jacob on Bowman, that. I'd, I'd love for you to expound on that. I don't want to switch things around to where I'm interviewing you, but I'd, but I'd love to have you on. You guys have to both come back on because we're going to have a long discussion. We'll have pieces left over. We'll have to finish it on skeptical. But I'd love to hear you expound on that from your perspective, Michael, in how materialism can be easily exposed as, as not true from the sure. 1700s. I, w w tell me what you're thinking there. Well, first of all, I hold by that fact that the greatest thought has been already, and you can fo focus in on you know Germany and of course uh, Berkeley from, from Ireland. Uh, they, they systematically refuted it. And then to unpack what, what I mean, but still to do it briefly, because as I say, it would take too long to go into. But just to give the gist of what I'm saying, to back it up, if people really conscientiously, and I mean rationally and conscientiously, not with one of these partisan you know, affiliations, but conscientiously and, and meaningfully are following the materialistic theories, and I don't care if it's phenomenology or neuropsychology or neuroscience or uh, any of the, or quantum science, they will find that it's coming back, it's Alice running as hard as she can only to come back to the door of the house she thought she had left. They're coming back to the, the mystical to the idealistic idealistic philosophy they're actually doing they never admit it in a million years you could pull teeth they'll never admit this on paper because it's their day job and remember you've also pointed out that the preposterousness and chicanery of this is evident because do any of these people you've asked and you asked this several times through the book do they go home to their wives and children and say well life is meaningless do they talk their kids through universities and schools and, and kindergartens do they relate to their wives and their grandparents and to death uh, that life is just a big bunch of meaninglessness, that the, the chicanery is not from outside. We can go within their own mindsets, within their own world, and expose them for, for the absolute uh, charlatans that they are. And then they you know, have this uh, dead philosophy that they keep on putting the marquee up even when it's been shattered. So whether you take the great German idealists, you know, or even, like I'm saying, forget the idealism, forget the opposing party. Their own materialistic philosophies, and of which there are many, Wittgenstein, A.J. Eyre, Bertrand Russell, right? The big names uh, have already on record uh, admitted that their materialistic positivistic paradigms were non-starters, they were unsustainable, they were false. How, how many people know about that? Very few. Then you have other, you know, things like, uh, say, Heideggerian, uh, you know, epistemology, uh, sorry, uh, phenomenology, phenomenology itself in France, existentialism. If you get into all of their things I'm saying, into the non-idealistic, materialistic framework and follow it through diligently, conscientiously, you will find that it comes back to the, they're driving up the driveway to the mansion of idealism and to, uh, and to uh, spiritualism, but they can't believe where they are. So this thing has to be exposed in this way. And that's really what I do, you know, to answer your question is that I will do that. I will give an overview of what idealism is, you know, in my talks or in my books. But basically, I'm trying to show you the chicanery. You just need to go into their own camp. And that's all you need. Their own bankrupt, maggot-ridden, you know, chewed up, regurgitated bullcrap cannot stand. And then on top of that, the cherry on the cake is that all the new neuroscience and all the quantum science and holographic theory and whole on theory is also then proving uh, the bankruptcy of, of hard materialism. I don't know what's left, but you see, I don't engage. To finish what I'm saying is I don't engage them directly. You do, and that's why I have a lot of admiration for you because I just sit in the background and do what I do and people come to me, but you have a boots on the ground, uh, which is so refreshing to see, it really is. Oh, well, uh, thanks. I don't know how else to do it. You know what I mean? Because. I, I, I like the engagement and I also feel like I do learn from the engagement. And it, it, until someone, you know, bold faced lies like you're saying or tries to bullshit you or something like that, that to me feels like progress because I like, I recognize that. 
I've seen that bullshit. I know that before. So now I, I, I have a sense that it really is as exposed as you just said, because I think that's one of the biggest challenges for anyone, and it was for me in coming to grips with this, but anyone who's kind of on the outside looking in, which is 90% of the people still, right, are on the outside looking in, they just can't believe that it's as dramatically different as you're really saying. They can't believe that it, 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 it's so. It, it, it's just too unbelievable. So to me, part of that grounding is to have somebody like uh, Dr. Susan Blackmore, who you know is is kind of interesting in the near death experience space. I interviewed her on the show, and to your point, I mean that was a pretty tough interview for her because I just kind of let her have it and said, you know, here's the research. What about this research? What about Dr. Jeffrey Long? What about this? It contradicts what you're saying. And she says, well, you're right. I mean, the, the unbelievable admission. She goes, you're right. You know, I I'm, I'm, haven't stayed on top of that research for 15 years. I shouldn't really comment. I was like, okay, okay, great. We'll move right along. The next month, kind of she does a presentation in the, the Scotland or somewhere in the UK, and she just stands up there and says all the old shit that she just says before. I mean, so it, it, it just kind of exposes how yeah. completely ridiculous the whole thing is. But for me, I needed that. I needed to see that pattern occur over and over and over again before I could really be grounded in answering the how can this be question? Because that's what it is to me. People are like, no, how can this be? How can it re world really be as upside down as you're saying? It's like, well, I don't know. It is. <laughs> well, and it kind of always has been, right, Alex? Like if you look at, like I came up into researching sort of out of the box thinking by looking at religion and comparative religion and mythology. Um, that's actually how I found Michael's work, which just changed my world because of the depth of how you could look at things very eclectically. But I grew up uh, in a lot of different, you know, I was brought up as a Christian Baptist kind of concept. And I was seeing the lies and the and the 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 in contradictions in people's faces and what they were saying even as a kid in that world. Right. So that'd be like the right. other extreme, right? And when I started looking at uh, some of what's coming out now, I got into because I wanted to get away from that. I was like, okay, I, anything but religion, okay, at that time. So I went and found the Daniel Dennett's and the Sam Harris's and the you know and the Richard Dawkins and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Christopher Hitchens would have been probably my favorite. One of them still is, but. Um, you know, found a lot of value there when it came to sort of debunking the, the religious claptrap, right, where it got extreme. But then I started seeing, hold on a second, but they're debunking it with this notion that you're just some kind of biological computer and there's no meaning. So it's like it's an extreme reaction to it. So I think for people it's difficult because they're looking at things like, okay, well, it's either you're religious and you pick a religion, one of the religions, and you go with that and you shut down your reason and you go based only on emotional arguments, right? And then, or you can go to the rational side where it's all just science and everything else. But when I was looking at them, like they're, they sound the same, like the preachers and the popes and all that sound the same as some of these people standing up and upholding this science, the current scientific paradigm. Um, and that's not to say science as a method is wrong. I mean, it's to say that what has happened to the institutions and the things that have grown up around it has rotted it out from the inside, just like what happened with religion. Because one thing that helped me was looking back and saying, well, not everything in religion was wrong either. There were some great concepts there. There were some great understandings. And you get into people like Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell, and you just kind of look at it differently, right? What was it for you? Like, did you have anything like looking at near death experiences? I'm sure you hit all the spiritual communities and all the religious communities to some extent. How do you balance those two extreme forces of religion and science? Well, I don't try to. I mean, I, I, religion is bullshit. I mean, it, it, it's so cultish in its in its nature, and it's playing on just this exactly like you said, David. It's pushing a lot of the same buttons, you know. So, is there a deep spirituality behind these religious? traditions and truths, undoubtedly, are people experiencing genuine spiritual transformation through, you know, some of these rituals, th certainly through some of these ideas without question. Is there a supernatural component attached to it? Evidence seems to suggest that it is. But 
do we have to deconstruct it in exactly the way that you're talking about, exactly the way that Michael talks about what your show is all about, Unslaved? I think we absolutely do. And I think you hit on a key component there that if you really are willing to take that next step and consider the conspiratorial angle of this, which is a central ethos to what I have become on Skeptico, is that, you know, I, I summarize kind of what the Skeptico ethos is about is three steps. One, follow the data wherever it leads. You know, it, it, the grounding in the data, in the science is a gift, is a tremendous gift because it, it does provide that clarity. But number two, look for the conspiracy. If you think people are just giving it to you straight all the time, you're just going to be led around by the nose like a fool. You, you have to. But then third, find the deep spirituality. And I really love that. that that's what you guys are about too, you know, in that if you can't find where there's some deeper meaning for how to live your life better, then what good does it do? We've all seen these people who spin their wheels on conspiracies and just want to get angry and all upset and all the rest of that. Well, what good is that? So what, what I think you pulled apart there in, in a beautiful way, if we were to dive into it further, is what drives the conspiratorial nature of religion? Why are these institutions pitching what they're pitching? And then at the same time, what's behind the scientific materialism? Who's driving that? And there's a third leg in there too that I've just started to explore lately. Do you notice how they're trying to weave the scientific materialism into the atheism? And they're trying to go, oh, you know, well, they're really kind of one and the same. And, you know, uh, it, and atheism, and uh, and then they're even getting into kind of the satanic kind of, you know, oh, doesn't all this kind of fit together? And it's like, you know, I'm not so sure all those things uh, do fit together. But you're totally right in that I think that they're, they're trying to create a, a forced choice. So they're trying to create, and I think they have, for most people, they see the forced choice. Religion, scientific materialism slash atheism. Those are the only two options. I mean, there's really nothing else, right? So I, I, I'm forced to choose between one of those. Hey, they'd love for you to see that as the only option because you're you're never going to rise above. They That's control the, the media. They control the media. So the they they it's like they deserve each other, right? The religious dogmatist and the yeah. scientific <laughs> yeah. materialist. Dogmatist. First of all, they, they play the same game. They're they're opposames. They're literally opposames who who wink wink nod nod. They know what they're doing under the table. And like in chapter 10 of your book, you go to town on them showing that this is a faux opposition, like you say, a conspiracy in, in some sense, uh, of hard dogmatists on both sides, the religious versus the materialist. Both of them is about as, you know, uh, they're, the, they're the pickpockets of the world. They're, they're the, they're what, they're, they, they've, they've constructed, you know, Blake's satanic mills and they know exactly how they're doing it. I'll denounce your dogma, but I'll replace it with my own, right? It's like Bible yeah. thumpers and Darwin thumpers, I think you mentioned that as, but truth is nowhere to be found any 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 part of it. Well, and funny yeah, you were I, saying, I, Alex, about the, you know, looking at the conspiratorial angle, um, and that word conspiracy has become sort of a, uh, I guess, a, it's a talismanic word in the way that when you hear people talk about it, they ridicule it instantly. Like, oh, conspiracy, that's instantly equated with tinfoil hat wearing nutbags that don't understand what's really going on. Whereas what we're talking about is, well, no, we're talking about sort of organized criminal behavior, uh, acts of the acts that are done in, in, in the dark that are there to uh, confuse and to bring about agendas and to, you know, sort of go against that law of justice. Uh, I think we've got a history, a clear history of, of human beings engaging in that. And we know that that happens on the lower level and we know what happens on the, the higher level in the, in the political world. And when we're talking about this, this sort of like, you know, you've got the extreme religious sort of conspiracy and then you have the, the materialist one. There's a very interesting quote from Albert Pike. Robert Pike says that we shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists and we shall provoke a great social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to all nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origins of savagery and the most bloody turmoil. And he goes on to talk about how essentially they're also going to be using Christianity and some of these other religions to create a, sort of a polar effect where it divides people. So when you have extreme atheism and extreme religious ideology you also have in politics the left and the right and you have all of these divisions 
And what is happening in America right now? The entire country is cut right down the middle, talking about this in a political context. And then you have the scientific and religious world still battling that out as if those are the only two options, as you were saying. But there are, uh, when you look at the great minds and the geniuses of the past, which is why I've always loved Michael's work, because he goes back as far as you possibly can and digs up these people and says, here, we've been talking about this for centuries. Um, then you see that, oh, there's so much more to the story than what we're given as our debate platform. You know, uh, just I want to bring one other thing into the on the throat on the table because I love this quote from you, David, that I pulled out of one of the episodes of Unslaved, and I think it's beautiful, and I, I I'd really love to get Michael to weigh in on it too. But it was something along the lines of, I'm not butchering it, but conspiratorial work is spiritual work, and I think that is so essentially true and surprising for so many people in a way that that it really needs to be. Un unpacked because, again, a lot of people in the conspiratorial community or the conspiracy community see no connection with spirit with spirituality, and it, in fact, are kind of more on the atheistic bent. And so, to tell me what you were thinking about that, and then Michael, I'm I'm sure you've had some thoughts or influence on that thought as well. Conspiratorial work is spiritual work. Well, I actually got to give it to Michael for introducing that entire concept to me. Um, but I, I guess what I was thinking of there is that when you're analyzing anything that's sick, that's where the solution to health is. So like I work in the field of health. I work in the field of martial arts, for example. And in martial arts, we're looking for a way of defending yourself against some crazy person that might come and try to harm you, right? And we're studying the art of war, but not in a sense where we're trying to be violent with it, but in a sense where we're, we're, you know, we're good moral people. We have a code of ethics. We work in a particular way where we can uh, face off against somebody that's trying to break that law of justice and come into your space and attack you or your loved ones, right? So you're dealing with sickness. You're dealing with a sick person. And that can be scary for people to look at that. That's, a, a, I guess, the conspiracy of somebody trying to come in and, and harm you in any way is it's, a, it's something nobody really wants to think about, but you have to think about it because there's a present reality. There's a present condition in the world where, sadly, there are people that are willing to steal in order to get ahead, whether it's stealing your property, stealing your life, stealing something from you. Okay, So in that reality, you need to be prepared. In the same sense, in health, if you don't analyze the effect of your body or the effect of your health, the fact that you're, you know, you're not feeling good, you're getting every cold and flu that comes around, or you have some kind of degenerative disease, or you're dealing with arthritis or cancer or whatever, that is actually a symptom of a deficiency. So if you say, well, I, it's too scary to look at the fact that I'm sick and I'm obese and I'm depressed or whatever, it's too scary to look at it, so I'm going to ignore it and repress it. Well, that's not healthy. That actually perpetuates the problem. So you have to look at the conspiracy happening in your own mind to deflect or to shut you down from wanting to actually analyze and find the solution. Because if you do look at that sickness, if you do look at that criminality around you, if you take that all the way up the political fracture and look at what the sickness is in our society, the, if you shine a light on that, that's where the solution lies. If you're ignorant to it, though, it perpetuates itself. So that's what I think I was trying to get at there. Michael, do you have any thoughts on conspiratorial work being connected to a deeper spirituality, personally? Yeah, because I look at those pathogens, just like David is saying. If your enemy can't kill, even if you draw with an enemy, you know, in, in one sense, in the Zen sense, you've won. So before you can defeat the enemy, can you just get the basic immunity so they can't even function? So evil is taken down when we can discern a wolf in sheep's clothing. That would help. Um, you know, so again, we're talking children there, right, as part of this. But just in general, we're even getting into that. Just the simple fact that if you can be immune, sort of psychic sovereignty, psychic immunity, then your enemy will cease trying to attack you. But as long as he can find the weak spot, then uh, if it's not this, what we're talking about, not evil, then in 2020, we'll have another one. And it'll, like I said, this thing has already gone on for hundreds of years. Materialism was shot down by some of the greatest minds. What are we doing? We're like children. We're like Isaac Newton said, I'm walking on the beach, picking up pebbles, having a faint decide what's going on. We've already had the heavyweights take this shit down. It's back again. Why? Yeah. So of course it has to do with spiritual. Uh, of course it has to be holy work because 
like he's saying, like David just said, it's immunity, but that immunity must be physical, must be emotional, must be, uh, you know, intellectual, so that you know what masters to go to. So my work is just to direct you, you know, signposts along the way, say, go to this person, go to that person, so you can avoid these people. But more than that, you can have the armoring now, if you just, if you just study them a bit and have a handful of, you know, facts, then you are immune to all of the barrage of these uh, toadies because they're the institutionalized. Remember, it's like Nietzsche had already given us the answer. Will the power is not the attribute of an individual. It's the, uh, will the power is the individual attribute, but it works better if I can work with a gang of people who have the same intent, goal, and will the power. So will the power is always seeking for collectivism so that it can work with a gang because it says I can get my goals if I work, but if I can collude with other people who all have a similar intent, I'm in. So when you find people impervious, like you know, a, a famous idealist said, I've gone to talk to the greatest scientists in symposiums, and as soon as I start talking about idealism or, or mysticism, or even some tenets of religion, they shut down. They can't understand even when I talk about the self. And he was questioning why that is. He didn't have an answer. The answer is simple, will the power. If you took one of those guys aside and sat with them one-to-one, -one, they probably would on a good day agree with half of the stuff you're talking about. But the moment they've come together in consensus, which is why they're a hive mentality, that's why these institutions exist, they're the satanic mills. The very fact that these black moors and others, they don't speak for themselves. They know it's my day job. I've got to wear my day job hat. I, I probably even secretly know it's a lot of crap. I maybe have an experience, even mystical experiences, but I, or even experiences in nature. My dad did, he was one of the most horrifically materialistic, Marxist, soul-denying creatures on the face of the earth. But I tell you, I've witnessed on good days sitting at a stone circle out there in the fields of Ireland, where I would watch and I would wait and, and there it would come. This question yeah. of mystery, who, the, who built this? This is amazing. I wonder how they did it, even he. So it, the, the yes. chinks, you know, with the, the paving stones, so to speak. But yeah, but uh, the reason why you can't get through to them as a crowd and shouldn't even really bother, there's a lot of other things one could be doing with their time and energy is because of the will to power having to have this uh, one part of the will to power is this idea that i'll collectivize and once they're in that um, clinch like a you know rugby scrum forget it you're, you're you're no matter how eloquent you are no matter how articulate you are no matter how filing cabinets of, of uh, facts and <laughs> you wheel in judgment goes against you you know and, and they win so there has to be another attack really and, and that's on the personal level you know and you get people to just sort of have an intuitive. I ask my audience, for instance, it, it, of course, you're going to be shy of a lot of these facts because of the world of education that you come from. But at least if you can have a sort of an intuitive agreement with me to go to the next level, sort of intuitively agree when I talk about self and I talk about, you know, the unwealth, the midwealth, whatever I talk, just just follow me intuitively and, and instinctively. You don't have to buy. I'm not telling you to buy into anything I'm doing. We walk together as a conversation and a dialogue. And, and that, I think, is a very, very important so that we can then you know allay this dogmatic situation where these people have built million dollar institutions and when i say uh, day job i mean it if you're a 20 something coming into the institution of science or philosophy or any of these materialistic uh, paradigms these bastions how can anyone listening to us now imagine that those people are going to start telling them, move the picture to the left move the furniture to the right you'll do as you're bloody well told You'll walk in the footsteps that they've, they've, they've laid out for you. you. And so that is institutionalization. And that is why people that you and I, you know, the, the people that you've talked to, read from the manual, read from the script, because when they walked in, it was very clear where the will to power was and, and the pecking order. And, and, and you will yeah, do as, as you told. They get weeded out if they're not. I mean, it, it's yeah, they're self. They're weeded out if they're not. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a self-perpetuating uh, self cleansing kind of process. I mean, you know, you just don't advance. You, you, you know, there's another, uh, I, I love so many of the things that both of you guys said to that. There's another more personal angle of it too, that I think is so interesting in any of us who've, you know, David, you mentioned coming from that kind of Christian background and having then the uh, awakening to atheism, which a lot of us can kind of relate to, and then a further like, hey, that doesn't really kind of fit all the way either. I had a really interesting interview, and I've never really had a chance to kind of completely process this, so I'm gonna talk about it now, but I interviewed this woman 
Suzanne Giesman, and she's uh, quite a, a, a mystic and a, a, a psychic, and does these you know amazing kind of work for people with people that we would all kind of look at and say, "Gee, isn't that great?" And she's leading people for towards light and love, and light and love is what she's all about. Well, of course, you know, as you mentioned. I'm skeptical, so I'm finding buttons to push, you know, just to push buttons because you never know, you know, you can't just have all this. So it turns out Suzanne Giesman, I mean, she leads with the fact that she was Navy, Navy commander, and that she was at the highest level and, you know, this and that. So immediately, you know, right, alarm bells are going off. I mean, you talk about institution and, and do what you're told. And then there's some interesting connections between her and 9-11. Like she was the directly associated with like the assistant to the Navy muckety muck who was called to the committee to report, hey, how can this be? How can you guys have no knowledge of this and all this? Wow. And specifically her name is brought up as part of this cover up. So I thought that's something we should probe. She's a light and love person. Go listen to the interview and see how quickly the light and love evaporates when we want to talk about, well, what happened? I, what's what's the story? I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about it. That's not it. You can talk about those things if you want to, but that's not what I'm about. I'm about light and love. Come on. Wow. Okay. So, I, I, I mean, to me, that's the other deeper spirituality with, conspir uh, with conspiracies, right? So well, if you can hold in your head the craziness of 9-11 and at the same time holding your head that we love the freedoms that our system does provide versus living in a petro yuan uh, currency and what that might be, right? So we can say, gee, I don't know, you know, I'm not a America, love it or leave it, but I'm not ready to move to China. How do I maintain those two things? And there's no truth there. I'm not saying there is. I'm not for climate change. I think it's bullshit science. At the same time, I certainly don't think we should go start just continue to destroy the environment and, you know, ruin the nest that we live in. Maintaining two competing ideas and balancing those and going forward, trying to find deeper spirituality, I think is an awesome journey to take and i like pushing myself you know pulling myself and pushing myself uh, with those competing ideas and the, the people who just move in lockstep you know and say well you know that, that was my history but now i'm all light and love well let's see let's see how light and love you are you know and at the yeah, same time of all hope. darkness you know i can't be all darkness i can't be the world is going to end tomorrow because you know, 9-11 or Pizzagate or any of the rest of that, which Pizzagate's real, but I mean, I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to hug my kids and, you know, we're going to go on and, and I'm going to live my life, you know, regardless. Well, there's definitely a tie-in. You know, I, I think uh, when I when you're speaking about that, I, I see the media's role because there's the event that happens in real time and real space, and then there's the media extravaganza which is a highly edited you know uh, doctored you know you've heard because what you're talking about you know mk ultra project monarch in which they've studied psychics they've studied clairvoyance and they, they have a lot of background knowledge there's whole institutions like sri and the hoover institute that have been guess what studying palmistry studying astrology studying uh runes and, uh, and and this is verifiable go to the noetic institute go to the integral studies you, you know people they'll tell you that this has been happening that they've been liaised with and that these uh, top generals and top uh, uh you know the elite basically the, the politicos they all dabble in this remember that quote from what was it jp morgan you know the billionaires use astrology the millionaires don't kind of thing uh hint hint <laughs> ha ha right and anyone you know who's followed my work, I can prove it. Go and look at the events that take place, and when they do, and you'll have a, at least a you know a semi proof of what we're talking about. But but the, I do think that the way the media presents it, it creates this traumatic effect, which then does, in some sense, bolster materialism because I oh, believe totally. that materialism, the whole paradigm of materialism, is based on ancestral trauma. 
uh, and we can't get into that, right? But the fact is the mind is already traumatized. So then in real time, in our time, if the rugs are continually pu pulled as they are through the media, I believe that the simplest, quickest, easiestly digestible cut-ups uh, drive-through teachings on all levels, I mean, on all levels, is what, what is accepted because now the brain has been flooded or the brain has been frozen. How can you expect an individual there to follow a philosophical, argumentative, like you said, hold two dissociated you know, ideas uh, up in opposition and work with it or hold a question close to them through all time? Are you kidding? They're going to have, they want the sound bite because the brain is totally frozen by this other ambient, unseen trauma. You know, that, that's the way I look at it too. Uh, that, that's really, really interesting in terms of, you know, just confusion as a control mechanism. And to me, that resonates as true because I think when we look at MK Ultra and we look at what they were trying to do with cybernetics, and tell me if we're getting into too much inside baseball here, but it doesn't sound like it, you know, it, it's easy to jump to the conclusion that, oh, that's what they're doing, you know, that's what they want in terms of total control. Maybe, but I like what you said too, because that seems to be really effective too. Let's just have people in this kind of bewildered sense of, you know, what do I really believe in anymore? And I can't really believe in religion and I can't really believe in this and I could just watch TV and, you know, I'll just be in this bewildered state. That's kind of a nice position too, if you're interested in just uh, controlling people. I also want to touch on what you said earlier, because I think it's a really important point that anyone can verify for themselves. So when you talked about MK Ultra, and then you talked about Project Monarch, and let's extend that to the example I always use because we explored it a lot on the show. If you look at what Stanford Research Institute did with the Stargate program, which was a right. psychic spying program with remote viewers, extremely well documented. And I've interviewed many of the people involved in that program on Skeptico, it is undeniable that it happened. And it supports completely your point, Michael, that these guys were so far past uh, this materialistic nonsense that it's like a joke. I mean, as terms of, gosh, gee, Oh, do psychics really work? Is there really something beyond that? that was out of the question. Their only question was, how do I how do I weaponize it? How do I operationalize it? How do I get it to work for me in the dark? But the flip, the, not the flip side, but the other part of that is they were at the same time promoting in the media, in particular in the science media and in the science institutions. Now you go out there and you say what bullshit all this is. You keep perpetuating this materialistic nonsense. So think about that for a minute. Deep state is all in with expanded consciousness and how we can weaponize it. They're all in. And at the same time, over here from a academic standpoint, they're pushing. Now you go push that other message out there. Again, follow up on what I'm saying, what Michael's saying, and see if you can read that any differently. I don't see how you can. That's just the evidence that we have. So that's that's very, very telling in terms of what their agenda really is. Well, and it's so good you brought up the Stargate program because there's so many instances of this. That's the thing. That's not the only one. There's so many instances of this where it's come out. And, th and this is even historical. We've gone on the show many times. Michael and I have talked about this where he brought up the thing about J.P. Morgan hinting at the fact that these elite people have knowledge that's not available to the general, general populations. The advent of religion in history uh, happened because most of the people in those areas were not literate. They didn't even know how to read. So the only way you could get any inst any kind of teaching from the holy books that were written down for you by the, the vicars of the gods, right, were to have them read to you by some priest class. But those priest classes, it's documented now, didn't even eat off that same plate. They didn't even believe what they were teaching. They were they were behind closed doors shaking hands with people from other religions. And like we got into a, a great episode on the Knights Templar, for example, and, and the history of like, you know, Protestantism, Protestant Reformation and Catholicism. And we were talking about some of these elite secret societies and groups. And these are not 
see, when you talk about this stuff, everybody starts going, oh, here we go, down conspiracy right. lane. Well, yeah, we're going down right. conspiracy lane because it exists. It's a real place. And, the, you know, it intersects with, like, what you said, cognitive dissonance. And the thing is, is that these, the elite, most eminent people, they constantly, in their memoirs, in their writings, in their meeting notes and everything, have, have been exposed to, to completely have a different way of looking at things than what is being brought out in the media or in the educational institutions or in the religious institutions, okay? So the fact that you're talking about how the military has this uh, program to probe consciousness, you know, through these MK Ultras and many other experiments, by the way, um, they've gone and tested these things out on uh, how to create these Manchurian candidate type individuals, how to uh, control entire populations of people by spreading propaganda. That's basic stuff. You can learn that in school. Um, so to understand how to control people, you have to control their ideas because ideas are powerful. That's what they know. Opinions are powerful. People that have an opinion and that can back it up with eloquence, with intelligence, with facts, they are dangerous people. And that's what they don't want. They don't want a bunch of people like us running around. They really, really don't. That's why they got to come and shout you down and be like, oh, and tap you on the head. Thanks for coming out and trying, Alex. You know, yeah, I know you're trying to do good, but really we're the ones that hold the degrees and you don't know shit. And that's the way you're treated. And it's the same with the elite classes. Oh, we're at our parties practicing astrology and Ouija boards and all this shit. And yet, oh, that's all poo-pooed because our representatives are going to go out and tell you that you're full of shit. And so the same thing happens all across the board. And so you got to ask yourself, if the most powerful people in the world believe this stuff, if it's good enough for them, and they actually use it in a weaponized way against you, where the, where's the disconnect in the average person that says, oh, well, that's just a bunch of bunk because Sam Harris said so. And that's what they are yeah. saying. That's exactly what they yeah. are doing there. They, remember the trauma, it, one of the other effects of trauma, ancestral or even contemporary, is where's daddy? Where's the expert? I have no, my brain is frazzled. My emotions are uh, in the shit. I'm depressed. You know, I'm, I'm halfway to suicide already. I can't, I can't even pay my bills, you know. Where's Big Daddy with all that abstractia? I know, I know on my deepest heart, it should be me on that journey, right? Uh, that's what it's all about. But no, but there's a much, much simpler way. Ask the local expert, right? And we have an, inst that's what the institution is. So it's the abnegation of selfhood, you know, because all of this thing revolves around selfhood. The more and for further and further you get away from the psychology of selfhood, the less and less things in the world make sense at all. The more and more you come back, hate to be Ayn Rand about this, but it's not that she's just the only exponent of that. This is an absolute axiomatic fact. That if you want to understand anything, you've got to stay close to the concept of selfhood because it's the erasure of your selfhood that all this collectivism and all this institutionalization and all of its uh, contraptions and its mechanisms, that's what it's all about. So one of the greatest solutions, dare we say that word that everyone thinks we never give, right? The, the solution is stay close to selfhood if you can. Start finding out what that is. It's a big black hole at the center of your being. Time to find out what it is because it's under attack. That's what's under attack. That's what's receiving the flack. So when you go out too far and get too abstracted and too into the whole thing virtually and impersonally, you will in the end only have certain amount of truth and it'll be like sand really passing through your hands. You know, there's so much more to this. Now, no matter how much power you have, no matter how, what a big boss hog you are, a general, a politician, it also comes down to this. It doesn't mean you're sensitive. Materialism is absolutely 100% articulated to insensitivity as a person. And you can read without whatever way you want, you know, uh, look the word up or whatever, because insensitivity is something you can't, uh, uh, you cannot you either have it or you don't. A, an external person cannot make you more sensitized, right? Uh, at least not, uh, not in a, uh, e not easily. So they can throw a lot of facts at you. They can throw a lot of their arguments and play this freaking bat ball game for eternity with somebody. But if a Dawkins, and I'm just using his as a name, or somebody along those lines, the hardened materialist, is an insensitive person in their own individual existential existence, in their you know in their in their very essence. Nothing on earth except a profound inner transformation. Of course, now here's the interesting thing. In one of your chapters, you actually mentioned, Alex, that when statistics came in, it was discovered that those people who actually start being big researchers in NDE and, and Deja Vu and uh, in uh, ESP were actually all originally hardened materialists. So this is a little ray of hope here. 
it wasn't people who were already predisposed from childhood or you know used to be into it. It was actually quite skeptical people that had because they had a, 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 a some sort of a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Not ecstatic, but epiphany. Some sort of a epiphany, spiritual or natural or other. And then they got into. Is that isn't that right? Didn't you find that out? Uh, is, am I correct? Correct when I say that that it was actually people who didn't give a damn before predominate when you know when you when you ask them you know why are they into that now is that true um it, it is and you, you hit on so many really interesting and to me important points and that you know from a very personal standpoint that was more or less my journey you know i'm uh spiritually kind of dense you know i mean <laughs> I've been doing yoga for 30 years. You wouldn't walk into a yoga studio and point to a guy and say, gosh, there's a guy who really has been doing yoga for a long time. I, you know, it just, I, I love it. It has deeper meaning to me, as does meditation, which I've done for a long time. But I, I don't have, uh, you know, fireworks going off in terms of transformative spiritual experiences. I say that because the process of following the data, which I think a lot of guys in particular, you know, and I'm more of a tech guy and that was my background in business and stuff like that. I want the data. Give me the data. You know, when I talk to my wife and I say, you know, for me, knowing precedes feeling. And she goes, oh, I, I completely don't understand. You're from another planet. You know, I have to feel before I know. And I go, no, 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 no. I have to know. Give me the data and then I can open up to the feeling. And I, I think that's uh, the, in essence what I, I found that you're relating to there, Michael, in terms of these researchers, you know? There's a lot of good kind of engineering, very scientific oriented, really science and engineering go hand in hand, but they're just like, they pounded on the data over and over and they said, well, to hell with it. I can't, I can't deny it anymore. That's the truth. That's the way it is. If you go back, you mentioned the quantum physics guys. And to your point, David, I love when you bring up quantum physics because people go, oh, here we go. Quantum physics. You know, it's like, no, just go read the shit. Go look at all those people. They all started out and they go, and then they reach some point and they go, well, to hell with it. Mysticism is real. You know, it's just, there's no other way to look at the observer effect and say that it isn't some kind of mystical thing. To hell with it. That's the truth. We just follow the truth. That's where it goes. Absolutely. There's people that were transformed. Their worldview was transformed by the data. And it's a valid path. Mm -hmm. You know, and then if you go look at the yogis, the yogis have that path too. They say, hey, you know, some people, they need to just study it and study it and study it. And that opens them up. So, if you're someone out there who is more data-driven, kind of more that way, there is a path. I mean, your show, you're giving out tons of data. I love the spirit of just go find it on your own. You know, don't take my word for it. Go, And I'm saying the same thing and, and coming at it also from the science angle. Dig into the science. Go read the research. Go read the other side. Come to your own conclusions. And that, too, can lead to a kind of spiritual awakening where you just hit that road and you hit that wall and you say, okay, to hell with it. I guess I got to believe it. But even, even uh, see, I think I'm, I'm the same with you that you have to, because my whole history of this journey has been with what you said, is the actual visceral feeling of not knowing and being ignorant. You know, Socrates said, uh, I know that I do not know. If you go scroll back to 1989, 1991, you know, when a lot of things changed for me, I was eaten alive by that feeling. It, it became a motive, you know, to say that, uh, yeah, feeling is all wonderful. I do a lot of feeling. I've done a lot of feeling. You know, I, I feel I am a sensitive person. But yeah, there's a big abscess there in the knowing. And I just couldn't accept that people like my dad, you know, could win all the arguments, not just him, but a lot of his cronies. And so I kind of set out with a vengeance, you know, to say, no, let, let me see. And that took me into their world. You have to get into their minds, into their world, find out what they know, and then know more. But I was going to say that, you see, if people think we're being very kind of pessimistic here, we can lighten that up because I believe that every person wants to be more. Every person wants to be better. Everybody wants to be heroic, right? It's this missing concept in our society today, heroic, heroic. Uh, and partly, well, looking to the father figure is, is, is a mixed bag because you're looking partly to the father figure, the expert, for good reasons because we have hero worship and I think hero worship is good. But at the same time, these are not heroes. These are demons, right? These are the little men behind the, the you know, the Wizard of Oz, uh, the, the, the sort of a curtain. 
But there was, uh, what was his name? He's uh, uh, one of the top idealists, um, Keith Ward, the Reverend Keith Ward. He said that there's two ways to approach any knowledge. You know, I, I, I would add the third being sensitize yourself. Gain the knowledge, read, study, but also while you're doing it, sensitize yourself because no one else can. So go out to nature, sensitize yourself, you know, because that's going to be extremely instrumental in awakening the intuition that can tell bullshit. You know, it's the bullshit meter starts with a sort of sensitivity. Uh, one could say more about it, about, you know, being grateful for being alive, realizing in the whole geological table and biosphere table, you're a blip. If that doesn't make you reverent, well, it doesn't make people reverent. This is the whole thing. They can look at geological time. They can look at the planet. They can look at the stars. They can look at the historical time. They can look at the human race, how quickly, uh, recently we've been here. And yet people are not moved to think, oh, my God, I'm here just for a blip. And, and that should then qualitize their life. It doesn't, right? But I'm saying it should. So go out and do things that make that possible. And then, as Kevin Ward said, Keith Ward said, there's two ways of coming at every piece of knowledge that's in front of you. The nomothetical, or he calls it the nomological, which is how everybody else sees it. That's the manual. How does mom and dad see that? How do my brothers and sisters, peers, students, what does Google say? Uh, what would the academia say? You know. And then there's the ideographic, or he calls it uh, axiological. Uh, I hate to dump, you know, dump these words on people. He says axial, coming from the Greek meaning, you know, more individualistic. Is this is what does it mean for me? And but to do that, you have to have self-esteem in order to step aside and say, okay, I'm going to bracket what everybody else thinks. How do I really think and feel about this? It's a key of introspection. You're not even a human being unless you're an introspective person. You can't even get the introspection if you're so bothered with what everybody thinks, feels, and says. So. There's a certain self-esteem mechanism that now needs to you know, come in, factor in, and that's missing. So there's a lot of solutions that one can give, but is anybody out there going to apply it? The sensitivity, the self-esteem, the idea that I should be introspective, because that's the only way I can discover what I think and feel personally about a thing. Our world is a post-psychological world, post-introspective world, in which it doesn't matter what you think. It's what everybody else thinks. It's what they say on Twitter. It's what they say on Facebook. It's what they say, you know, these, te these preposterous creatures at the front of a classroom. You know, so there's a lot of, but, I, but as I said before, I, the positive aspect is I believe everyone, I said this in Architects of Control, without the hidden hand of conspiracy, we're being kind of gratuitous about it there, but more lightly, the hidden hand of Big Brother, the hidden hand of the authority figure, the institutionalization, the total institution, the governmentality, without all of that, man would fly. So I, even the most banal person, the, teen, the lost, chaotic teenager, you know, no, I think it's an inherent, innate that man has wings and he would naturally fly to the heights and think great thoughts and be great if it wasn't for and this does indeed bring in that conspiratorial path as david said you know they all don't want to run the, well you're going to have to turn the lights on and face it because i believe that man inherently is a spiritual divine being that wants to fly and and, and touch the stars and it's only because there's other things preventing that and playing veils games with you and playing checkmate with you and and, and deceiving you, you know, that's there. And it, therefore it does become a very, an act of war. Uh, you know, we are in an act of war, the bullets are flying and we have to dedicate ourselves to fighting these, these, these creatures. Well, you have another way that I really uh, like and appreciate, and maybe you want to touch on this, but you have another way of kind of highlighting the positive angle to all this. And that's that we are co-conspirators in the slavery. So, you know, if you get all hung up in the, oh my gosh, I can never, I can never, you know, beat these guys. So Michael comes along and I love this. Hey, you're a co-conspirator in that whole thing. You know what? Sure. You are part of it. How have you bought into it? How have you oh, yeah. submitted in ways that, that you don't have to, but you just habitually have done that? I think that's extremely empowering. And I think it ties back to all the things that we've talked to and, and all the things in terms of uh, the conspiracy stuff as well. So maybe you want to just touch on that. Well, before we, I Michael, will, just but... sorry, to, sorry to interrupt there. Before we go, maybe what we'll do, because we are, we're just over time here on the first hour, let's hold that thought and let's open up our advanced session with our members with that, because I think that's a great place to take it. It also ties into your question, Alex, about the spiritual connection to looking at the bigger issues in the world. So ladies and gentlemen, just want to thank you for tuning in for this free hour. Come over and follow us on Unslave. Become a member uh, and the advanced session will be starting over for members there. So come and check us out. We'll catch you here next time on Unslave. Cheers. Want to be more than a subscriber and explore these mysteries deeper? 
David and Michael open up the archive of research and take you through more advanced knowledge reserved for more serious study. Become an Unslaved member and receive unlimited access to full-length downloadable MP3s and HD video of all Unslaved episodes ad-free. Be seeing you here next week at unslaved.com. Thank you.